All right. So if we can please move to the next slide. Thank you. So um, I'm really thrilled to have our speaker with us today uh, for our webinar on youth, sport, and cultural interventions in pre preventing violent extremism. Insights from Kenya. Our speaker is from Kenya. She is a Commonwealth uh, scholar from 2016. Um, and she is Lynn Gisheha. Uh, from Kenya. Um, Lynn is a 2016 Commonwealth Scholar. She recently completed her PhD. Um, and in this webinar, she will be presenting on um, her, uh, her interest within this topic and also her research findings. Um, so yeah, we are really looking forward to the presentation today. Once again, um, if you do have questions for the speaker, please do feel free to share them in the chat box. Um, we also have received quite a lot of uh, questions from our uh, attendees today. So I'm really looking forward to uh, put them forward to our speaker in the Q&A session towards the end of um, the webinar. Um, so yeah, without uh, wasting a lot of time uh, and now handing over the floor to our speaker, Lynn, over to you. Thank you so much, Ava. Good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you're tuning in from this Friday. I hope that you're all keeping well. Um, Ava, thank you for such a great introduction. Um, <clears throat> today, I'll be walking you through bits and parts of my thesis and also my research and also just my, my passion really for sport for development and peace. So um, I'll be moving us to the next slide shortly. Thank you. Right, so I think it's only fair that I give you a bit of context or a bit of background into who I am and how I ended up where I am today. So my name is Lynn, Lynn Chirurbai Sambili Gishea. Lynn is fine. Um, I am from Kenya originally, but currently living and working in the UK. Um, my journey into SDP actually takes a bit of a, a back step into international relations, which is where I started at the United States International University of Africa, um, which is in Nairobi, Kenya. And there I studied international relations. And my, my topic and interest really has been grounded in community development and in peace building studies and getting a greater understanding of how these tools, um, how these can be used to support society at a grassroots level. Um, but then come 2011, there was a new program that was launched in, by the International University of Monaco that was known as the Masters in Sustainable Peace through Sports. Now sports sounded like the perfect conduit or the perfect offering that I could give in terms of how to address some of the societal issues when it comes to peace building, when it comes to community development. So then I applied for this master's program. We were the inaugural class and it was a very unique course in the sense that we had both academics and practitioners teaching us the skills on peace and sports, how to work with youth, how to work with communities and how to Take care of these relations as a coach, but also as a practitioner. So it gave me this solid academic and um, <clears throat> academic and practitioner lens, which then informed uh, my return back to Kenya and the formation of Sports with a Goal Africa, which is Swaga in short. Now, Sports with a Goal Africa is this logo that you're looking at here, this really nice logo of Africa, and it's really our. Um, our vision is to reach, connect, and empower both individuals and communities to opportunities in and through sport and to really improve their livelihoods. So Swaga has been part and parcel of my journey up until now and continues to be. We have a, a budding team um, and we've managed to grow through the teething problems that any organization would go through um, that works at the grassroots level, but to also just get really connected to the community and offer um, empowering opportunities to young people. We've worked with high schools, um, girls schools. Uh, we have a program called Wasjana Wasomena Wacheze, which we've worked on together with coaches across continents. So our prim primary medium uh, or primary sport is football, netball, um, but we work with coaches across continents who have helped us develop a curriculum that 
looks at self-directed learning. And what that essentially means is that at the end of each training session, for example, when you come to SDP, Sports for Development, which I'll speak to later, at the end of each training session, you then ask your participants to reflect back on the game, whether you were instigating conflict, how do they handle that conflict, for example. Um, and it also, we have, we've, uh, through CAC, Coaches Across Continents, we've also created coach back sessions with the teachers to see how they will then, at the primary and secondary school level, um, have these programs run. How will they work together with the young people? Or how will they work together with the students, for example? So that's something that we've continued to do. Obviously, with COVID-19, we didn't have our program in 2020, but then we have continued to now rebuild back on that, um, which I'll speak to later. Another program that we've done that I think is quite important to mention here is the One Ball, One Bike and One Goal initiative, which is essentially a 25 day journey across eight different countries on the African continent, 7,000 kilometers long from Nairobi to Cape Town, South Africa. And we were distributing these small balls that are called indestructible footballs, which are created to work in um, rather um, harsher or harder environments, um, but giving young people access in rural and semi-rural uh, communities access to sporting equipment and facilities. But the journey and the essence of this was grounded in SDG3, which is the UN Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is to promote healthy lifestyles and health and health and well-being. And we, we learned a lot because we interacted with about 20 um, different sports for development and peace community-based programs along our journey and it was sharing of best practices. In Malawi for example, Chituka village, we learned a lot from the young people there. The girls were really good in football and they were showing us how their different drills and how that has sourced or sounded, a, been a sounding board and a, and a source of economic and um, gender empowerment. Anyway, so long story short, from Swaga, that has continued and journeyed with me all through to my Commonwealth um, scholarship, which then <clears throat> started in 2016. Now, how I transitioned into PVE or into preventing violent extremism is in 2015, there was a conference that was held in Kenya, the first ever regional conference on countering violent extremism. And I was one of the young youth, dele youth delegates at that time at this conference. And I remember asking a question on, have you considered sport as a potential medium? And my question was met with a lot of uncertainty, um, opportunity and blanks as well. So that, that fueled my, my thinking and my curiosity as to how, whether this could actually be a potential route. And so with that, I, I, I applied and I um, became a Commonwealth Scholar in 2016 and did my studies at Loughborough University, which as you may know is ranked number one in the world for sports and sports related studies and had the opportunity of a lifetime to work with colleagues and practitioners who are renowned in the field of sports for development and peace. So that's a nutshell, a journey into myself. And with that, I finished in 2020 and I have now um, joined the Commonwealth Secretariat as project manager for sport for development and peace. So that having been said, I thought a, a perfect segue to that would be the Commonwealth Secretariat. And for, for me to really just give you a bit of background into who the Commonwealth got, who, the Commonwealth Secretariat are. Now the Commonwealth Secretariat has a Sport for Development and Peace team or unit that's dedicated to just that. And we advocate for the use of sport as a vehicle for development and peace building. And how we do this is that we help our member countries. We have 54 member countries. We help them maximize the benefits of sport because we believe that when used effectively, sport can contribute to improving health and education, creating employment opportunities, stimulating economic development and realizing human rights and gender equality. Our work in sport can contribute to national development objectives. And we believe that it can also be tied to the 2030 agenda, which is the UN Sustainable Development Goals agenda, um, which serves as a blueprint to aim and aims to end poverty to protect the planet and to make sure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Now, these are laudable goals, these are massive goals, but the, <clears throat> the nitty gritty of our work really is to provide that technical assistance in the form of expert advice and training to officials. This could be Ministry of Sports officials um, or practitioners in different ministries to help draft policies, discussion papers, 
guidelines and toolkits, as well as offering support for monitoring and evaluation. And this is really our work is guided not only by the SDGs, but by this green and red book, which are available on the Commonwealth website, by the way. Um, but they're guided by these measuring of impact because we need to measure the contribution of sport. And I know that was one of the questions. How do you measure the impact of sport, physical education, physical activity to the SDGs, for example? We've um, created or co-created the sport and SDGs indicators because we believe that measuring the impact of sport plays a key role in coordinating international organizations, governments, and the sports movement. So we have this common framework, which I'm referring to. It's these two here. We have category one indicators and category two indicators, sport and SDG indicators. And I'd, I'd, if you're interested in this topic, you're very welcome to, happy to share this information after the presentation. But really these category indicators um, support in tracking the success of, of governments, sports-based organizations. And it also helps sport for development and community organizations elaborate the evidence-based arguments to show that we had X number of participants this year, um, we have X number of girls participating, and this has been that. So that we move away from that tokenistic, um, you know, floral, but not concrete uh, measurement of impact, for example. And it's really important because then this then informs the investment that we do for sport. Um, other things that we've done during COVID-19 at the height of the pandemic, for example, which is just speaks to who we are and what we're about is we've continued to remain as vocal advocates in terms of aligning sport policy. And so at the height of COVID-19 in 2020, for example, we established the Commonwealth Coronavirus mm. Response Center that has have had online resources curated to support communities in the in their continuity of sport online. Because Sport was among, I mean, a lot of sectors were affected by this unprecedented global pandemic, but then even the sports sector suffered. And so now the coronavirus response center served as an, as an intermediary platform that would then be available to any, anybody within the Commonwealth, anybody who was holding a sport for development program could access these resources and use them, tailor them to the needs of their, of their participants. Right, so back to the PPT here, the presence of SDP as part of, Commonwealth, of part of the Commonwealth strategic plan has helped differentiate its offering as an INGO since 2014. And it's been really important because in 2015, for example, um, in 2015, for example, um, sport was recognized as an important enabler uh, for sustainable development by the UN under the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development which essentially lays out the groundwork for the SDG framework. Now sport, just to reiterate, is an important shared heritage across the Commonwealth. Extremely valuable actually, I might say, because it brings, it can be used to bring together the 2.5 billion citizens that are of the Commonwealth. In terms of how the sport and the SDGs work together, or how it can contribute to this post 2015 development agenda, sport can be used to address, for example, SDG three, which is on health, or four on, equal, in, uh, on equality and learning, five, eight, 11, 16, and 17. And just to give you an example of SDG three for, for purposes of time, for example, how can sport ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages? Number one, sport can be used, sport events can be used to convey health messages and sports projects that can attract people who are not easily reached by conventional health education. Sports levels, um, sport, uh, SDG three through sport can help us recognize um, or increase participation in sport, excuse me, can um, increase participation in sport by reducing the risk of health diseases and NCDs. It, we also need to factor in the economic impact of physical inactivity. So the costs and the burden on healthcare if people are not participating in sport. Um, for example, the cost of physical inactivity will cost India $7.5 billion and the UK $26 billion by 2030 if appropriate measures are not taken between now and then. So it's really important that we, that we actually invest in healthy living, that we get the Commonwealth moving. And this is part of those platforms that we're using. Um, another key document that you're very welcome to have a read on is the Kazan Action Plan, which 
on top of sustaining or looking at the sustainable development goals and what we reinforce, the SDGs that we're committed to, CAP or the Kazan Action Plan also looks at reducing inequalities, responsible consumption and climate action, which are also very key when it comes to tackling um, using sport. But both of these instruments, the SDG, the SDG indicators that I spoke to before and now, uh, and the Kazan Action Plan, are part of that global commitment to link sport policy to the SDGs. Right. All the Commonwealth platforms that are important to mention here are the Commonwealth Youth Sport for Development and Peace Network. It's one of a number of Commonwealth Youth Networks that we support, that is supported by the Commonwealth Secretariat. CYSDP is a youth-led organization that was started in 2013 and is committed to advancing the use of sport as a tool for development and peace. Its objective really is to advocate, educate, and demonstrate how and what are the benefits of using sport, both at that government level, government to government level, but also downstream, also at that community grassroots level. So it's about that advocating, increasing that youth voice. And as you can tell, I'm really passionate about youth voice. So this is one of those, um, networks that's important to join. If you're between the ages of 15 and 29, are interested in sport, I would advocate that, I would suggest that you look at how you can be part and parcel of these platforms. Right. Now we move into the PhD research, which is really, I'll be trying to bring together elements of youth, sport, cultural interventions, and how they can be used as offerings to prevent violent extremism. Insights here will come from youth voices and community voices as well. So the aim of my study was to advance understanding around how sport and other locally empowering approaches, which um, we coined during the study, can support the prevention of radicalization of opportunity youth in Kenya. I decided that it was important to, I found this definition of opportunity youth as very important because opportunity youth speaks to their abundant promise. Um, we're not blaming the youth. We're not uh, calling them at risk, which then further reinforces feelings of marginalization. But um, in Kenya, opportunity youth living in socially and economically disadvantaged locations tend to be increasingly at risk of incentivized quote unquote work by the Al-Shabaab terrorist network. My research spanned over five locations. I started with broad stakeholder interviews in Nairobi and also a youth group there, and then traveled to um, Lamu first. And in Lamu, I worked with two organizations that I'll speak to later on in this presentation, and then traveled by speedboat to Faza, and then further on another two hours by speedboat to Kiunga, which is um, about seven kilometers from the Somali border. And it was important to gather the insights of youth from peripheral or who are outside the core of Nairobi and to really see and also there's there's government information or government links to show that uh, research sorry to show that these are areas that are at higher risk of um, al-shabaab in infiltration and um, recruitment but that's not to say that it's not the same with the northern corridor or across Kenya um, as you might know or may not know, the Al-Shabaab have increased their modus operandi and their tactics have gotten much stronger and more emboldened given the recent rise of radicalization and violent extremism in different parts of the world. So yeah, so those are the locations, Nairobi, Mombasa, Kiunga, Lamu and Faza. My research objectives, I had four. The first was to analyze the complexity of trust and its critical role in enabling better state and society relations. Number two was to map the plausible push and pull factors behind radicalization of opportunity youth in Kenya. Third was to examine and document the life experiences and interactions of opportunity youth in and out of sport development programs, youth sports and cultural clubs. Finally, it was to highlight the social and cultural benefits of skits in mobilizing youth against radicalization in Kenya. Certain key terms that I think are important just to inform how we're going about this study. Al-Shabaab in full, Harakat Al-Shabaab Al-Muhajideen is loosely translated to mean the movement of the youth. And they're an insurgent group that seeks territory, legitimacy and political control through targeted ter terrorist attacks. Um, across the East African region and Somalia, for example, they have laid this modus operandi, this, this seeking of territory and um, research shows that they're branded as spoilers, which is just really to 
re, um, reduce development initiatives that are happening, um, but also to seek that legitimacy and that one-on-one um, -on -one connection with the community as well in order to enforce Sharia law, their version of Sharia law, excuse me. Um, SDP is the intent sport for development and peace. And it's that intentional use of sport, physical activity, and physical activity to contribute to development and peace goal. It's there to achieve those non-sporting outcomes, such as empowerment, um, inclusion, um, resilience, for example, or, or education, and most importantly, employment. So that's sports for development and peace for you. Opportunity youth, which I alluded to in the beginning, are young people between the ages of 16 and 24, who find themselves in this period of social and economic transition into adulthood. And <clears throat> opportunity speaks to their promise, as I just said earlier in the other slide. There's also the element of youth weighthood. And what is that? It's that prolonged and certain stage between childhood and adulthood that is marked by a young person's inability to enter the labor market or to attain the social markers of adulthood. Um, it's a contested term when it comes to sociology or anthropology in the sense that young people can contest or can create agency within weighthood, which is something that was so encouraging to see even for myself during my study is that even in this waiting, waiting to, to, to get their identity cards, for example, they had found ways to emancipate, they had found ways to create or co-create spaces where they were recognized, where their voices were heard, and where they were making, um, where they were making a, a living from that. Push factors, when you think of the word push, these are the conditions that push someone into radicalization. It could be that unemployment, it could be that um, loss of identity, it could be marginalization, or even violation of human rights. This can happen in the, harm, the arms of the law, but the police, for example, or even just in, in, in the reduction of human dignity and, and rights. So that can push somebody to consider radicalization. Pull factors are those things that draw you in. What are those motivations at the individual level? The processes that play a key role in transforming ideas and grievances, ideas and grievances into, actually, I could consider radicalization and violent extremism. Finally, you have violent extremism, which is that willingness. And I want you to remember it's that word willingness to support and use violence to further particular beliefs, including those that might be political, social, or ideological in nature. So it's that growing willingness, and it usually starts with radicalization. <clears throat> this was just an, a diagram or an illustration that I used during my presentations, during my PhD, which is to show that at one side, you have a young person who engage in, is engaged in sports programs and there's that hope and that promise. But on the other side is to show that really there's that increasing risk that they could also be uh, radicalized. And it's also maybe important to mention here that sport does not belong to anybody. It, it can be used by both um, militant groups and sports for development groups but it's important that we just that does not mean that we stop that means that we must increase opportunities for good within sport for development and peace these are statistics from the start of my study um, and the source of this is UNDP Africa in Africa alone in 2016 over 33,000 people had been lives had been claimed by violent extremism there had been over 4,000 young boys who had been re re recruited by the Al-Shabaab between 2010 and 2016. The numbers are much higher now. Um, in Kenya alone, back then, now it's over 500 attacks, but back then it was 373 Al-Shabaab attacks in Kenya. Um, and really this just speaks to how this is a growing issue um, in society. It's not something that we can, we can put to the side. You know, it's just to show you that the global extent of the problem of radicalization and extremism, the episodes of youth violent crime in England, for example, numbers have gone up by 6% in 2020. And that includes violent extremism from the, and this is from the National Statistics Board. Globally, there were over 7,500 lives lost to terrorism in 2019 and 2020. In Kenya, Terrorism attributed to the Al-Shabaab increased by 83% between 2019 and 2020. And this is all coming from the Global Terrorism Index report. So there's also been that shift at the global of the terrorism landscape. The landscape. There's the online harm with the rise of far-right extremism and right-wing cultures that's taken root both in the US and in Europe. So things are evidently more complex 
and complicated than they were three to four, five years ago when I started this study. Social systems and governments are vulnerable to shocks and the global concern is higher than it has ever been. And a mobilizing of different stakeholders is key and is so important right now to counter these trends. So these are the challenges that, we, that we're dealing with at the, at the level. Another key statistic here is to show you that when I started my study, Kenya's population was at 48 million. Per, uh, 48 million. Now it's at 55 million. Yet what's quite staggering is that over 40% of these young people are between the ages of 18 and 35, and 70% of them remain unemployed. So much has to be done. Outside of the formal sector, we need to consider other forms of um, employability and empowerment. It could be through the non-formal education sphere, but this is something I'll speak to towards the end. What are the drivers of violent extremism? This is basically a summary of the push and pull factors that I spoke to in the definition slide. It could be economic exclusion, insufficient self-corrections, political exclusion, that's a really big one and, and uh, also came about in my study. Radical attitudes of us versus them, ninini than ICC, or being told that this country belongs to certain people. Uncertainty is a massive factor in the sense that you do not wear, know where your future is going and that attributes to that youth weight that you feel. And fairness, perceptions of injustice, corruption is a big one as well. And that mistreatment, mistreatment um, at the hand of government state stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> and this leads to that active recruitment because you have these in individual emotional and psychological factors that are linked with social factors, family. It could also be the influence of family or um, education or the church of mosques, for example. These are factors that um, could contribute to radicalization. I'm not saying that they fully contribute to radicalization, but I am saying that the microsystem plays a very, the microsystem or the, the immediate surroundings of a young person, for example, play a huge role in how they are interacting in society, what they're taking in, what they're, what they're, what they're absorbing. And so it's important to pay attention to that because then it does lead to active recruitment and violent extremism. So sport in the context of PV, how does this come about? Sport, as I've said earlier, has been considered as a tool for building bridges. It also has these special features and attributes that can contribute to non-sport goals, such as poverty reduction, violence, and everything else. Um, but then when you think about um, issues of how does it then work in the context of PVE of sport and as a primary prevention, sport as a primary prevention tool, you have youth engagement at the heart of it. And we have this five zone, we have this five zone approach that um, is carried out, uh, that is carried out at different levels. So the first level you have, how can sport be a primary preventer of PVE through safe spaces. It's that meaningful engagement that you have there. Um, when you offer a safe space to a young person, then they feel that they are safe enough for them to talk about the issues that are affecting them. And then that leads automatically to social inclusion. When somebody feels included, then there's active participation that is born out of that. And that provides the opportunity for education on these life skills or education on what it means to to be aware of violent extremism. And that builds a person's resiliency. And that builds a person's resiliency um, through peer learning and critical thinking. And finally, that then leads to youth leadership or empowerment at that level. So these are some of the, this is part of the five zone approach that I'm now going to speak to very quickly. Um, Sport fosters important human values in the context of PV and serves as an effective platform to address the ideologies and root causes of violent extremism. Esport is also being cautiously considered as a vi viable, viable to sport, uh, viable tool in preventing these social development outcomes. Um, <clears throat> sport. So when we talk about the emerging areas of sport and PV, for example, we have the Regional, we have the regional, um, we have the regional conference that started in 2015, but there has been a buildup since then. Um, in 2020, the UNODC started the Preventing Violent Extremism Through Sport Technical Guide, which I was part of co-creating and 
uh, co-developing. And experts met in Vienna to critique this guide that we had created on how can sport prevent violent extremism. There's also been increased traction because in 2020, the UN uh, Counterterrorism Office um, established the global program on promoting sport and its values as a tool for preventing violent extremism. The Commonwealth as well has the Commonwealth Violent Extremism Unit that is housed within the governance um, unit. And they also speak to these issues, working with young people um, to ensure that issues of CVE are tackled or are addressed from that youth perspective as well. So just this is just to show you that it's an emerging area, that sport, when I started my PhD, there wasn't this much traction, but now there is increased um, understanding and opportunities for it. So what are the five zones? These are the ones that I spoke to uh, a minute ago. We have zone one as safe spaces. Um, zone two would then lead to social inclusion. If we were in a sporting space, and this is it being identified with the community, you need to get the community buy-in when you're trying to solve this issue. Then that leads to social inclusion because then you have participants who have similar backgrounds and similar issues speaking to each other and building those relationships, building new relationships. Then that leads to opportunities of education, finally resilience, and finally empowerment. A more elaborate spelling of this zone is that, um, if you can have a quick scan to this, is that, for example, in zone in safe spaces, it doesn't have to be a football field, for example. It could be a social hall in a community. It could be where you engage with local NGOs, experienced coaches in the community. It could be through other things that you have to factor in our equipment. Is a space appropriate? Can both boys and girls engage in this space? Do we need separate rooms for different sessions? Um, transportation to and for from this, from this space, uh, from this location that's been identified. Social inclusion, you need to identify young leaders and prepared coaches. Um, and you also need diverse participants, people from different places who would otherwise not speak to each other to share these uh, learnings. You'd need to educate the trainers and experts in this area. You'd need counseling at hand and ready to speak to young people who may be suffering from trauma or have experienced episodes of violent extremism, for example. But you also need to um, ensure that you're building their resilience by inviting guest speakers, um, providing examples of resiliency in sport and linking them to sports clubs, for example. Finally, also within this guest speakers, young people will have also started identifying where they would want to go in terms of an economic or a economically empowering pathway. And that's where it leads to that formal education actors or non-formal education actors, youth support workers, providing them with opportunities to grow their careers outside of waithood. Quickly, I'll move us through the stories that I received whilst on fieldwork. Um, again, it's important to note that there were feelings of uncertainty, possibility, and real opportunity that were expressed throughout the five locations. My research methodology, I had 20 broad stakeholder interviews in Nairobi and across, and this included federations, church councillors, imams, government officials, UN officials, for example, and then 70 youth voices. Now that is a lot, I can understand, but it was, um, the fact that most of my interviews were carried out in Swahili, for example, reduced that interpretive pitfall and also broadened the reach. I, I think that it helped not silence too many voices that would have otherwise been left out of the research. So that was an added advantage in terms of, I could pick up on the social cues uh, that young people were saying or what they were not saying when they're meant to say what they needed to say. Um, so that led to that snowball effect in the sense that one youth group would then say, you need to speak to this other youth group. And that added on the numbers to get their perspectives and really propel this as a study that was centered on youth voices. I started in Lamu uh, Island and as part of my embedding into the research. What you can see here is that Lamu is a very unique, uh, it's, a UNESCO, it's a UNESCO social heritage site as well. But you know, Lamu Island is, is beautiful. It's almost as if time stands still there. Um, there's no main roads. Most people will journey through these, what you would call twittons here, but narrow streets. Donkeys are the form of transportation and water primarily. Um, that's the Lamu, 
uh, emblem, for example, if you wanted, but it was just to show you, this is just to show you a look and feel of that. What you're looking at here, these are pictures from my research, for example. What you're looking at here is that every evening around seven o'clock, I would find it very interesting that only men would gather at the Mkunguni Square to watch the evening news. And that was a daily ritual. So the, the island was filled with rituals. It ebbed and flowed with rituals of culture, metaphors, symbolism, and that was part of the work that was done by these two organizations. The first was Kiunga Youth Bunge Initiative, and the second was Lamo Arts and Theater Alliance. Now, just moving quickly, as I've said, everyday conversations were filled with proverbs in Swahili culture that were, and it was used to allude to something or to wrap up a story or to cunningly pass a strong message to another. And this didactic approach to life allows a society at large, but most importantly, young people to make sense of their world from a tender age. I found that really interesting. And, and as it developed, that's how I had a fourth research objective, which is the one I spoke to in terms of kids, because it was something that I had set out to look at sports and sport for development and peace, but I found that skits was something that was considered in society. So just an example of a quote. I asked the founder, Munatumia Sports, do you use sports? And he said, no, we do things differently here. We use music and, excuse me, we use music and theater, but we don't use music as much as we find that skits are much faster. Skits take approximately, approximately 15 minutes and include everybody. That was profound for me because I found in these spaces that young women were not participating in sports, but they had found ways to include the entire community to continue that inter intergenerational um, flow of stories and lessons being shared every day in, in different ways. And Lamu Arts Theatre Alliance have used skits to project or to um, speak to issues of social injustice, to talk about police brutality, for example, to talk about Al-Shabaab, to talk about uh, radicalization, to talk about, or as they call it, itikadikali, to talk about these different issues that would have otherwise been quite difficult to convey in sport. And so I had a whole chapter where, you know, kind of analyze what's the difference between sports and skits and how can we then maybe widen the scope for locally empowering approaches to then be considered to work alongside sport or for sport to work alongside them. This is just images from Lata's presentation. As you can see, the whole community is involved and they do these skits, which are 15 minutes late, uh, long. And they invite the different stakeholders. For example, they invite the police who are the mistrusted by the community along to these skits. And you can see here that um, they're reenacting a police scene with a young person, for example, and how police brutality is played out. So whilst we're laughing in com uh, com uh, comedy and there's that relief, there's also that space or that space to ponder and reflect on what is actually being said here. And the opportunity is given to the young people and to the community to ask rather difficult questions to the police forces, for example. This is a police officer who said, in actual fact, you know, sports touches a lot of people, especially young men, but for now, music and theater is for the whole community because people like to come and be entertained and those kinds of things. And now quickly moving on to Kiunga, as I said, from Lamu to Kiunga is a two hour speedboat journey. We had to stop by Faza, um, Chundwa Sports and Community Club. And it was, it was a privilege to be able to see Kenya in its full glory in different sides of Kenya I've not been to. This first image here is Borneo Forest, which is known as the unofficial hideout of the Al-Shabaab. This is Ishakani village um, where there have been uh, attempts to by the Al-Shabaab really to speak to the community and, um, and that's been an issue in the past. Here you're looking at women in the well, um, fetching water from Kiunga, the Ziwa. And um, that's, that's me on the speedboat journeying there together with Kiunga Youth Bunge and that's typical breakfast uh, that I would have had. This is an important image because of the story that's embedded here. Mkokoni is en route to Kiunga and the driver of this truck known as the jackal, told me that, you know, I'm stopped daily. As I'm transporting fish from the sea to, to the border, I'm stopped by the Al-Shabaab to ask for intelligence. And then I'm also harassed by the police. And so I find myself living in this tension between the community and the Al-Shabaab or the police and the Al-Shabaab where I'm not trusted by either. And so it's a very dicey life experience that he leads. But I thought it was such a, such a rich story, a perspective that you don't potentially consider of how 
this affects the young the community. The ID card, um, if there are any Kenyans on this on this webinar would understand the pertinence of this identity or state citizenship card. Youth participants in these locations felt that due to their ethnicity or their religious belonging, they were often denied and characteristic uh, uh, often denied opportunities to have their ID card. This youth participant, for example, said, if you go to the farms, it's silent now. With the ocean, you have to have an ID and getting an ID here is difficult. Other places you go to the Huduma Center with your document and it's done. Here, you have to be investigated, a question by the CID. This is just a regular young person. So I said, so then do you get a certificate of good conduct? And he said, he said, no, it's, diff it's not good conduct. It's one bench with the chiefs and the community leaders. And on the other side, it's the CID where they interrogate you. So he said, yes, that's the way it is. And without an ID, you cannot leave and neither can you work. You cannot enter here, Kiunga, or leave without an ID card. And if you did, all your clothes will have to be poured out and then you're bagged for them to see what you have carried. So traveling here is a problem. So they are already feeling geographically cut off. But then on top of that, there's that social and economic marginalization that comes from immobility, not being able to move freely, yet you are considered a Kenyan, but not really a Kenyan. So this issue of the ID card is important to resolve. Faza, for example, the young man told me that, look, we are Muslims, there's nothing that can blackmail us or trip us easily. Um, maybe the lie that you could get us on is by using money. Looking at our livelihoods, we're in a tough place. The government has deserted us and we are not known. We have young men who have finished high school. Some have stayed for 10 years and they're home for leavers. So when the radicalization comes with two or 300,000 Kenyan shillings, it's very easy to catch that person. Now, this is a translation from Swahili to English for purposes of this webinar. But it was just to show you that they would consider it. They would not want to, but forced to the corner they would. In Kiunga, the girls told me that the lack of gender-friendly spaces where they could participate in sport, because for them, many of them were being denied by their parents due to the type of clothing or lack of facilities that were there. So this girl was saying, for example, in this focus group that if she traveled with a t-shirt and tights alone, then to play netball by the post where on the other side there would be boys practicing, it wouldn't paint a good picture and their parents would get angry. So that greatly limited their opportunities to sport. In contrast, MTG, which is moving the goalpost, is a program in Kilifi, Kenya. And here the girls were telling me, Wako secure, we are fine. According to the community here, I can say the drug abuse in Yokitu Nachofanya, it's the thing that is making most young men to use drugs a lot. Kutumia mihadarati. Boys wish that they had a program such as this one that we have as MTG. So to say the truth, girls are secure. Yes, there are still those many challenges that we face, but we're okay. So that was in stark contrast to show how an SDP program is working in one location and in the other, there's a dire need for it. So another focus group I asked these young men, because it was this men who met me for this particular one is, would you think that sport could help deal with the challenge of radicalization? And they laughed at me, they laughed to my face and they said, it cannot work because sport does not help. And when I asked why, they said, when you look at the challenges that they're facing, they're in close proximity to the Al-Shabaab's influence and control. There's that marginal investment in sport and SDP by the local government. There's high unemployment and rising poverty levels. Most notably, there's that acute lack of trust between them as young people and the police in this community. So that rises, that brings up these tensions that are hard to ignore and that need to generally be dealt with both at that county level, uh, government level, but also at the national level. In Mombasa, on the other hand, sport was seen as a, sport, as a source of hope for the Old Town Sport for Development and Peace group. Young people here were telling me that Kwakweli football has saved us from being idle and being involved in drugs or walking around to the clubs. You know that sports and those things don't mix. So if we decided to play football, we have to put those things aside. Also, they were part of this Amani Mashinani, which is peace in the grassroots program that has really built up the team spirit and resilience against issues of radicalization and extremism. So we're eagerly awaiting for chapter two. Right, so in summary, these are some of the organizations and sports and arts in the PVE space. It just shows you that the sector has grown and it's so encouraging to see from a researcher's perspective that 
support and the arts are being considered. So these are just examples of the programs that are currently existing. I've spoken to some of these in my uh, uh, presentation today. Jongoze KEs in Nairobi is an excellent program. Even the UN Secretary General attended um, the platform and was there when he was visiting Kenya. We have Epuka Ugaidi, which is a government program. Epuka Ugaidi in Atalanta, which is escape or flee from or move away from uh, radicalization with your talent. And they have a whole web uh, YouTube series that's available if you wanted to watch some of that. Concluding thoughts. In summary, when we look at my PhD and, and this presentation today, and how does sport build towards peace, justice, and strong institutions? Again, just to reiterate that sport is a shared heritage across the Commonwealth for its 2.5 billion citizens. It has that unique ability to convene. And if used effectively, can enable positive sustainable development, but some parts remain underutilized both at policy and grassroots level. Sport is understood, but is also not fully understood or fully grasped. And that's the continuous work that we need to do. PVE is a rapidly growing theme in sport for development and peace, but at that doctorate level is still under-researched, but it's still again encouraging to see that policy-wise, the UN and the Commonwealth and other organizations, and Kenya, for example, has now 47 county um, uh, preventing violent extremism guides. Then other things that we need to consider is that readers need to consider the relevance of thinking about different youth populations and their life world in and out of sports programs in the global south. These voices are often not heard enough and it's important that we hear their perspectives. Today, I've just shared a snippet of some of the quotes that came, and there were hundreds of quotes that came through with the PhD, but it was just important for us to think about the relevance of other youth populations. Citizenship, it signals that sense of belonging and acknowledgement, and it's something that the state needs to make sure that they're working hard to ensure that the young people feel included in society, as this is a strong pool factor when it comes to extremism and radicalization. The government also needs to work hard to reduce the lack of fair access to government social safety net programs, such as health, business, higher education, as the Al-Shabaab are poaching on these and capitalizing on these needs to offer that sense of belonging, money, um, and inclusion. Sport and SDP operate in tandem, we need to consider operating in tandem with locally empowering approaches such as kids. Sport is not the only answer, there's other ways, there's music, there's kids that we can learn from. Finally, context matters when it comes to the study of sports, development and peace in preventing violent extremism. We must work to build trust. And with that, thank you so very much for your patience. That is the end of my webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you too. Take a couple of few seconds uh, <laughs> to relax. Um, Thanks. I was watching the clock. <laughs> no, it was a brilliant, brilliant presentation and so it was very enlightening, very, very interesting. And um, I'm sure you will see in the chat box, um, you know, the feedback that you have received from attendees already. Oh, um, I'm going to log and see. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you once again for your you interesting too. presentation. And um, before we, you know, begin with the Q&A session, uh, I'd like to say it was really commendable for you to, you know, put forward your research findings and give in that information about um, not just your research, but also sharing your experience with us um, within this field. So um, I will invite Hi, attendees. I will invite attendees to um, send in your questions in Thank the you. chat box. Um, we also have a, a few questions that were shared by attendees um, while they registered for the webinar. So what I will do is I will uh, bring some questions, uh, put forward some questions to you, uh, okay. while at the same time, I will monitor the questions that are coming in in the Q&A uh, in the chat box. I see some, yes. Oh, so are you, you ready much. for the questions? <clears throat> yes, let's go. I'll try my best. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so the first question is around, um, you know, the Al-Shabaab group that you mentioned. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What encourages young people to join Al-Shabaab recruitment and radicalization? There's also a follow-up question to this. Um, 
how other stakeholders can work in collaboration with your organization in creating mm-hmm. solutions for empowering approaches to enhance sustainable development and build more resilient communities against the threats of al shabab recruitment and radicalization mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on that so um the first question what encourages young people to join the al shabab there's those push and pull factors that I spoke to at the beginning of the presentation, which are the push factors are feeling marginalized, for example, or feeling left out of opportunities to engage in the civic movement. For example, with this research, um, majority of these young people in these locations specifically had tried to enlist in the National Youth Service, the NYS, but then they would go for these trainings and be told, oh, you know, one of your eyes is not working very well. And this is just verbatim, me sharing what they said. Um, It's not to blame anyone, but really just to show that they were actively looking for opportunities to engage or to work with the government or to work for Kenya as Kenyans, but were being denied those opportunities. And one young person said something really stark, which was, look, to hold a gun, whether it's for the NYS or to hold it for, whether it's for the police or to hold it for the Al-Shabaab, the day for dying is, is the same and I will do the job that will give me money. And so they're pushed to these opportunities, they're pushed to these very difficult pressing spaces, these complex pressing spaces that would then make them consider that. But on the other hand, some are seeking that thrill, um, that sense of adventure, um, that sense of belonging, uh, the hedonistic values that come ar- around that, or that sense of belonging to a wider group uh, that comes with the Al-Shabaab, for example. And I have to say that they're, they're really good at curating their narrative across East Africa. So it changes how they will recruit in Somalia, for example, will be different from how they recruit in, in Nairobi or in, in Kenya or the Northern Corridor in Kenya. So whereas drugs and um, drugs or other things are, or, are, that are, are seen as Western or sport, for example, is seen as a Western construct and therefore, cannot be part of um, the Al-Shabaab's offering, but they have poached young people in, in, in Kenya in different parts whilst watching sports programs or given the Muguka, which is a cat, for example, those who are using drugs, for example. In Somalia, they have a version of halal football, which is incredible that a, an extremist group would you know, kind of, find of, kind of find ways to morph in order to be more appealing to the demographic that they're trying to target. So I wouldn't say that you openly go to join the Al-Shabaab. There has to be a grievance or there has to be, um, whether it, it's your grievance or it's a generational grievance or something that's happened, that you're seeking that validation and they offer that validation outside of the status quo. So that's the first question. Uh, could you mind us the second question? What was it? very briefly yep Just so the this, yes the second question was around how stakeholders can help um and and you know work in collaboration with your organization uh, okay. to work towards solutions so they um stakeholders in when it comes to pve um if i was to answer it from a from a comsec perspective or community secretary perspective is to join in within the networks that are existing that are speaking to these issues at the policy level um when it comes to working with governments for example there are ex- there are programs there are programs that exist i would suggest using ministries ministries of justice security um collaborating we live in a in a digital world, engaging with these organizations on Twitter, for example, finding out what's happening, being curious and being um, passionate and commitment committed to these opportunities that exist. If it was with regards to sports of the goal Africa or Swaga, more than happy to facilitate that introduction um, after this webinar. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Lynn. That was quite an interesting response to the question. Um, my next question is um, from uh, an attendee who's asked, is there any government organized program or any mm-hmm. methods to control youth joining Al-Shabaab terrorist group? Yes, there is. Um, there's a couple, but the one that sticks out the most is the Epuka Gaidi program. Epuka Gaidi program that I spoke to briefly in my presentation. Um, 
advocates for the use of talent. Um, I know I was asking them to consider sports as well, um, but they're using talent where young people are creating these, reenacting these videos that show their life world and there's prizes to be won and uh, that are used to really sensitize the communities, but to sensitize young people, reach young people and engage them in the way that they um, the best understand. And some of the production quality is really evocative and really rich uh, in terms of explaining the risks of radicalization, why you shouldn't be part of the Al-Shabaab movement, for example, and also evokes a lot of deep thought into what can be done differently. So there's the Epuko Gaidi program, there is the Tafsir program that happens with Brave Building, resilience, um, building bridges, building resilience, uh, brave program that I can drop in the chat. That was really working with community stations and radio stations to talk about these issues of radicalization and really going through the underbelly of why is this bubbling over in our society? Why are we having issues of extremism rising up and what can be done about it? So those are some of the government programs that exist. But then again, for Kenya, there exists, there's a, there's the, for example, I was part of, I, I was, during my research, Mombasa was launching their action plan, Mombasa action plan on preventing violent extremism. And it's available online. Every county in Kenya now should have a action plan on preventing violent extremism. The mention of sport is there, but it's been lumped together with sports, arts, and culture. But it's the spelling out now that we are advocating, that I'm advocating really with, for example, the technical guide, because I think that's where we, we're lost in translation in the sense that how then do I use sports to prevent violent extremism? Or how then do I use it to, and the key word is prevent, we're not trying to counter it because that's already too late. It's preventing getting young people or old people to, to understand its values. So I would say the action plans are available and also the, those different programs. I hope that helps. I'm sure, I mean, um, the information you provided is so in depth in terms of your field experience, you. Um, you know, in Kenya. Um, related to youth and, you know, preventing violent extremism, mm -hmm. um, we have the next question mm -hmm. around that. So, um, in your view, how uh, do you think unemployed youth can engage in sports? Um, mm -hmm. And how can that give them means to uh, livelihood? That's a very good question. So if I can just take you back to that summary table that had the five zones, the five zones approach, right? Um, I won't bring it up now, but the five zone approach, remember I talked about how we have safe spaces, inclusion, education, resilience, and empowerment. So within, and an employed young person can participate in sporting programs that will then build opportunities for them to play with other young people who are like-minded and looking for opportunities. But what makes this five zone approach unique is in the sense that within the resilience and education zone, we have employers or people who are um, looking for young people, looking for work, being part of this model. And they can then um, work with the, can then serve as mentors, like buddy, a mentor buddy system that through sport, for example, then provides opportunities for these young people, because we know that they're already learning these key core values that we would need of teamwork, of um, inclusion, of understanding, of patience, all these things are being taught within an SDP setting. They can then be replicated in the, in the office setting. So how can that be done? It's through partnerships. It, we, we cannot operate in silos. We cannot just have sport for development programs, having one program here, and then employment opportunities not being merged with these opportunities. So it's to bring these people to the field of play and to increase those opportunities for young people. So that's one way. Um, other really practical ways is non-formal education platforms, for example. It doesn't have to be an office job. In FASA, for example, the young people wanted us to, when I asked them, what is your big ask? If I was here with your governor, for example, what's your big ask? And they said, we're really good at fishing. So can we have, um, a center set up for us that we can create uh, our own, we can, we can create our own fishing boats or we can be taught these skills. So we really need to play up the non-formal 
education sphere across the Commonwealth. And that's something that they kept mentioning. They said, we've finished school, for example, we are, we are educated, but we see that there is an opportunity here for us to look at non-formal education. So that's another way that we can tackle the, the rising challenge of unemployment. Start thinking differently about employment because it's changed. Mm. Yeah. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, it's about uh, your research respondents. So were you able to interview the extremist group and um, the youth that you interviewed, were they still working for Al-Shabaab? <laughs> Good question. No, all I can share is a little expert from, except from my studies that um, in one of the locations, probably not best to disclose where, um, it was a very uneasy focus group discussion. And at the end of it, my chaperone just whispered in my ear. It was this lady and she said, one other you an informant, they think you're an informant. And I said, oh my God, no, I'm not an informant. Informant for who? He said, they think you're an informant for the police. Um, therefore, they can't really trust you. And that's why they're dicing around your questions. Um, another quote that came up was they said, oh, somebody just casually mentioned, oh, and that means, oh, they know you're here. I said, who is there? And said, oh, the Al-Shabaab know you're in the community. Uh, but they don't mean any harm because they know the work that you're doing. So that for me was... That's scary, but it was also relieving. Um, then I realized the risk. When you think of your ethics board, risk board, it had gone off the roof at that point. But I can't say for sure if I had integrated with or had conversations with young people who had been radicalized, but I can say I did speak with young people who may have considered it. And I can say that they did know I was there, that I was conducting this research at that time. Um, and I And I will say that I still want to follow up on the promises made during that study, which is to ensure that a equipment gets to them, but we're also finding ways to engage them beyond the research. So yeah, I that's the most I can answer to that. It, the, the level of mistrust was so high. It was high at the with the police thinking that I was a journalist, high with the community thinking I was an informant. So it's just this part of the of the process um, of learning. Thank you. Well, that was, I'm sure that was quite an experience for you. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you for sharing that piece of information with us. Um, the next question is uh, from an attendee who I believe is also studying in a similar field, okay, uh, if I'm not mistaken. That's a very interesting uh, question, um, which is um, there's an as aspect of Kenyan football fans engaging mm -hmm. in spiteful exchange and mm -hmm. sometimes fights after the match. Um, the attendees also mentioned, I believe, uh, the, the football groups. Uh, but could it mean sports at some point trigger violence among youth? Absolutely. Um, sport is uh, not a panacea. Sport has the studies that speaks to football hooliganism, for example, and how this instigates violence. And we've seen it also in the wake of um, racism in sport, for example, we can't, we can't hide away from that, mm -hmm. where we see it on the pitch, one day you're a, you're a hero, the next day you're, if you didn't score, for example, you are, you're booed down or, or even worse. So the question was whether sport can serve, can also have negative effects. Yes, there are negatives to sport. Yeah, there's the dark side to sport. There's a whole study around that. Um, but having said that, we need to realize that sport cannot work in and of itself. It needs to work with wider structural uh, programs that will support that. And we need to continue that education around the good in sport, the positives of sport, um, and to ensure that it's not diluted by these other other issues that that really unfortunately are part of society um that that's yeah so there is a, there is a dark side to sport it's not does not belong to one group alone it can be used by anybody but we need to within sport for development and peace we're we're talking of it as a catalyst for good and really propelling it in that direction 
Mm. No, that's quite interesting. Um, I am aware of um, the time. We have yes. slightly overrun our, our webinar yes. time. So I do know. have one final question that I would really like to uh, put forward to you uh, before we end this presentation, this webinar. Mm -hmm. So there's a question on replicating your research. Um, is there scope to replicate your research uh, in Pakistan or for that matter, any country? Um, yes. Yes, the scope, the scope. What I would say, as I said in the last slide, is that context matters. And so the development of the program would need to bear in mind the, the contextual factors within a Pakistan society, Pakistani society. But that having been said, it can be replicated 100% using the five zone approach, for example. I would say that would be a great start, uh, starting point. Um, yeah, and I'd be happy to be part of that research as well and offer any insights or suggestions for, for this scholar. Yeah, sorry, just looking at that question for Kenya and could it mean that it at some point trigger violence among young people? Yes, Stephen, you're very right. Goramaya AFC, that I was in the stadium when that happened once for Charity Cup. So yes, it can happen, but we need to, that's, there's instances where sports can be used by to trigger political violence as well. So we need to be aware of that, even as we're creating spaces for young people to engage in sport. Yeah, but that, on that question for Pakistan, absolutely it can be done. And it's important that um, a good starting point would be the five zone approach um, and the guide. Thank you. Oh, and on that note, I would like to direct our attendees to get in touch with you uh, via LinkedIn. Yes. Uh, Lynn is a member of the Knowledge Hub Strengthening Global Peace, Security and Governance. Mm. If you are studying or working in a similar field or would like her inputs on uh, your existing piece of research, Lynn is more than happy to connect with you and provide uh, support or discuss um, any further questions that you might have please feel free to connect with her um, either on her personal LinkedIn uh, with the same name mm. uh, or through our CSE's Knowledge Hub, Strengthening mm. Global Peace, Security and Governance. Okay. With that, I come to, uh, I end the webinar. Thank you once again, Lynn, for this wonderful, wonderful webinar. Um, it was really insightful and I'm sure the attendees feel the same. Um, so thank you so much uh, to the attendees. Yeah, thank, thank you for you, joining everyone. us. Thank and you very, very much. Thank yes. You. Well, thanks, Darianne. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for sharing your questions, not just in advance, but even, you know, interacting through the chat box uh, for the Q&A session. Um, thank you. With this, I, I end the webinar. Uh, I hope you all have 